so much. Thanks for coming out. Um, I want to thank the Historical Society, of course, um, Alan and Mitch and Kate and everybody else who does incredible things uh, for the Historical Society. And if you did not donate or even if you did, please consider donating or donating more. Um, I don't think, I don't think Emily Liskin is here. No? Okay. But I wanted to either thank or blame her, depending on um, how you look at it. Um, because in, so eight years ago, hard to believe, in 2013 I had um, this book out about the pseudo serial killer named The Oddest Tool. And talking to Emily, she said, You could do a talk here. And I was like, Really? On oh, Oddest Tool? And she said, Well, that'd probably be too dark. Why don't you do the history of murder in Jacksonville? <laughs> Which, <laughs> so. So that talk was 2013, and that led toward a lot more research, which led toward the book Murder Capital that came out last year. And actually, the Southlight Gallery um, was very generous in having uh, and figuring out how to do some kind of book launch in the midst of COVID um, last year. So I'm very grateful to them. Uh, and that leads to 2021 and this talk tonight. So, um, <laughs> Emily's not here, but I was going to say, you know, you can either thank her or blame her, but I'm grateful for Emily that's good. Um, I'm going to share with you several stories, not every story in the book. The first story I'm going to share with you is from the 1890s, the last one is from the 1980s, uh, though it actually technically ends in 2017. Uh, I'm going to try and keep out some of the more upsetting details. These are murder stories. There are upsetting details. And I'm not necessarily talking to you about the stories that resonate most with our culture, but they're there. In particular, I want to mention um, that there's a story about Johnny May Chappelle. Several of you know about uh, the murder of Johnny May Chappelle in the 1960s uh, in the midst of um, racial turmoil in Jacksonville and that her son, Shelton Chappelle, who was only a few months old at the time, has been seeking justice for his mother um, his entire life because of the four men who murdered her. Um, only one of them served any time, and he served three years. So um, I want to mention that you know there are stories like that in the book that I think are incredibly important. And sadly, I wish they didn't still resonate today, but obviously they do. Uh, and I'm going to end tonight with some, uh, some thoughts and questions about why this, this city, my hometown, has this terrible moniker that is the title of this book, um, Florida's Um, so this is my website, just really briefly, I get to plug myself for a minute, so um, as, as um, Dr. Jameson said, um, it's close to 600 stories there, he was so kind and gracious to meet with me out at Edward Waters College, which I teach at FSCJ, and um, you know, I'm an alum of UNF, and I feel like Edward Waters is uh, integrated into its surrounding community in a way that no other college in Jacksonville really is, and that its success could lift Jacksonville in so many ways, uh, like, you know, Morehouse or Spelman in Atlanta. Um, and um, so I'm grateful to him for um, being so kind as to tour me around the waters. Um, but lots of stories there. A um, few people have asked me about a couple of books that are for sale. The last time I talked here, I talked about um, the book Goat Island Hermit, um, channeling Anna Fletcher. I hate to say that any woman is the wife of, right? But everybody knows Duncan Fletcher, or at least knows the name Duncan Fletcher because of the school. Uh, they have no idea who he was. Um, he was a senator, um, U.S. senator from Florida for 27 years. <laughs> So this is the wife of Duncan Fletcher, but she's a fascinating person in her own right. She was a spiritualist, so she went to seances all over the United States. She wrote two books about spiritualism, and she argued against Harry Houdini before.
before Congress, when Congress was looking at uh, uh, coming down harder on what they saw as fortune-telling fraud. So she's a fascinating character. And um, Repossessions is about, uh, it's not so much about the mass shooting itself that happened in 1990 as it is about the aftermath. I spoke with so many of the survivors or um, family members of victims, uh, and it was put on as a play at FSCJ or a teach a couple of years ago, and Jax by Jax 8, um, October 15th and 16th, is going to offer a sampling um, via Reader's Theater from Repossessions. So, just a quick question of those. Uh, so, start off, I'm going to talk about several stories, as I said, not all the stories in the book. This is a story, briefly, pieces of the story, about the murder of Marie Louise Gatto in Springfield in the 1890s. Assassin shoots Miss Gatto, screamed the Florida Times Union headline. A beautiful girl now lying at death's door, she accused a rejected lover, says that George Pitzer did a foul deed. And after several more such lines, intense excitement prevails. The hysterical newspaper style of the 1890s leads so neatly through the Florida Times Union quotations and statements of fact, it's hard to tell where the sensationalism begins and ends. Marie Louise Gatto died, the TU implied in April 1897, for the crime of, quote, offering no encouragement to the very ardent passion of uh, George Edward Pitzer. The dashingly handsome and socially esteemed Pitzer had pulled a knife and a pistol on her two months earlier in the parlor of her parents' home. The two had talked through the afternoon, but when it came time for Eddie to leave, Marie told him what she told him so many times before. She did not feel for him what he felt for her. Standing in the foyer, Pitzer pulled his jacket to the side and flashed a knife from his vest pocket. When Marie screamed and called him a coward, the wording of the Times Union, he jabbed the knife into the stairs and broke the blade. He pulled a pistol from another pocket and declared, There now, I won't be called a coward. <laughs> Gabriel Hidalgo Gatto left Almodello Cigar Factory down on Main Street. The building is still there. At 6.30 the evening of the attack on his daughter. Gatto had managed purchased El Modelo, the largest of 15 Jacksonville cigar factories that together produce 6 million cigars a year. Got those 225 workers, hand-rolled several brands of cigar, including a namesake, Hamlet, La Tropia, and one called Florida Alligator. The city cigar factories also serve as fertile ground for the raising of revolutionary consciousness to overthrow Spanish rule in Cuba. Gato's brother-in-law, Jose Alejandro Juan, won election to Jacksonville City Council four times and brought the revolutionary Jose Martí to Jacksonville eight times, beginning in 1891, to enlist Jacksonville's Cubans the cause for independence against Spain. Having reached Laura Street in his carriage, Gatto heard a commotion coming from the direction of the old Panama Road. According to the Times Union, Marie said, I'm, where is it, the Times Union? I'm shot, Papa, and I'm dying. Edward Pitzer done it, and he done it behind the bush. It's the quote from the Times Union. <laughs> Gato told the coroner's jury that Pitzer often brought his daughter candy, which he usually refused to accept, whereupon Pitzer would 
hour in rant. Two or three weeks before, Marie told Reverend V.W. Shields that a pincer had told her she had a choice. Either she could love him or he would kill her. Shortly before Marie took her last breath, she dictated to Judge A. O. Wright her dying statement. It read, I know I am about to die, and that I am in a dying condition. It was Eddie Pitzer who shot me. I looked right at him and saw his face and know that it was he. I saw him shoot me. He shot me five or six times. He shot me this evening as I was coming in and without provocation. Her dying declaration as admissible as if she died declaring it to judge and jury should make the case airtight. Actually, have I explained everything in the previous? So, um, this is actually, this was a uh, Senator Austin Mann's house, uh, <coughs> documented as such, but um, shortly before it was demolished, not so many years ago, um, it was uh, discovered, actually, Joel McEachin, if you know Joel, um, you know that he knows like, everything about Jacksonville history, um, figured out that this, is, this was probably also the Gatos house, um, and the old Panama Road, there are um, vestiges of it that still go through the middle of Jacksonville and the north side, and this is, um, this is a photograph of the, the doors of the house, obviously much altered, um, just before it was demolished. I think the year was 2000. Um, this is Jose Alejandro Alejandro Juan. This is an ad for the Gato Company. Um, this is Jose Martin. And this is uh, the ship, the Three Friends, which was um, a gun running ship to uh, Cuba from Jacksonville. Um, all right. George Edward Pitt's sensational trial began with faintings on Tuesday, May 25th, 1897. Pitzer had sauntered into the courtroom, newspapers reported, whistling, quote, a jaunty tune. During jury selection, Pitzer loudly told his mother, seated next to him, that he would beat one juror as soon as he got free of this whole thing and demanded a deputy take him to dinner at a nearby restaurant. The request was denied. <laughs> Women came in crowds to see the handsome murder suspect sent flowers to his jail cell and swooned in court. Of course, the trial took place in a packed courtroom in the summer with no air conditioning, <laughs> and women wore multiple layers of heavy clothing and hats, so that could have been a factor in the faintings. <laughs> the story has all kinds of intrigue, the accusations that Pinter suffered from, quote, revolution envy, of Marie having or not having several fiancés, Pitzer claimed he met a man for a duel on the bridge, was abducted, and taken to a secret place in La Villa where he fought the duel and won. I'm going to skip some of that, or actually all of that, to um, his defense attorney's bombastic closing arguments. And this is his defense attorney. Um, the ostentatious former Confederate soldier Alexander St. Clair Abrams, who said no one could view the murder of Marie Louise Gatto with more horror than he, but that her family indeed, he said, the Cuban community of Jacksonville wished viciously to prosecute and hang that boy. Oh. He that did that deed, he thundered, may he never enjoy a woman's love. He that did that deed, may he never enjoy a woman's confidence. He that did that deed, may he never press a baby's cheek to his. But one crime, he said, one crime was even worse than murder. 
One crime exceeded, exceeded that of assassination, and, and that, quote, is judicial murder. That is when a man is convicted and hung on evidence of fabricated facts. He bet the jury, though he hated the death of Marie Louise Gatto more even than her own family, he said, not to commit a crime worse even than Marie's murder by finding Eddie Pitzer guilty. His speech went on and on. It went on for six whole hours. <laughs> the old Confederate sweated and shook in the hot June courtroom. When he described Pitzer's love for Marie Gatto, he did so with as much passion as Pitzer himself ever did. Just as he hated the murder more than the girl's own family did, he now seemed to love her more even than her lover. Why, you said, should the defendant kill the girl with whom he was in love? Why kill the woman to whom he was engaged? Why kill the woman whose lips he had just kissed? Do you mean to tell me the hand of love fired that gun? No, he said, the crime was not that of a lover, but that of a hired assassin. He correlated this hired assassin with Pinter's own story of a hired duelist wearing blackface in a room within a room somewhere in the anonymous night in La Villa. St. Clair Abrams described a purpose for this hired assassin, the Gatto family's antipathy toward Pitzer and the cause of Cuba Libre. I beseech you 12 American jurors, he said, to protect this American boy from hate and revenge. As you would have, he roared, in future years, a jury to deal with your boy so may you deal with this boy. My duty is finished, yours begins. I hope your action will be such as you will not hereafter have anything on your conscience to tell you you have not acted right in this matter. He staggered toward the judge and collapsed at the bench his head turning back and forth deliriously. A deputy sheriff and an assistant attorney dragged him back to the judge's chambers. The court proceedings had ended for the day. The crowds did not dissipate. When St. Clair Abrams finally came to his senses and cried out, in the words of the Times Union courting him, where is that boy? They can't hang him. They haven't hung that boy, have they? Did I finish my speech? <laughs> George Edward Pinter was found not guilty. He soon left town. He died on December 3rd, 1914, 37 years old in Dormont, Pennsylvania. Unless I know for sure what happened to her, I guess I'll always have hopes. So said Beverly June Cochran's husband, James Cochran, janitorial supplies salesman for Albright Sales Company in 1961. James still lived in the three bedroom house he and his wife and child had moved into just a few weeks before Beverly disappeared. The house was lonely. Every day, he replayed the Wednesday. He'd come home from work at 6 p.m. February 24th, 1960, to find his wife gone, their baby crying alone in her crib. He told the Jacksonville Journal that when he got home, it was getting dark, and there were no lights on in the house, 
When I got to the side door, I found it unlocked. That was unusual too. The Cochrans had been married less than two years. Their 13-month-old daughter, Carolyn, went to live with Beverly's parents. James rented out a bedroom. No one ever saw or heard from Beverly Jim Cochran again. Evan Spencer was in jail on charges of two murders and told police he had dreamt about seven others. Soon headlines would refer to Spencer as the dream killer. Spencer identified a photograph of Virginia Tomlinson, a 48-year-old Jacksonville Beach waitress who'd been stabbed to death and dumped far south in a wooded area of Vero Beach. On July 28, 1960, the Orlando Sentinel reported Spencer's claim that he was in the car with a man named Shorty and his 17-year-old girlfriend, Mary Catherine Hampton, who was, at the time of the story, in jail in Key West for larceny. Spencer had been in jail since April 15th, the day he bludgeoned John Keene to death in Key West. He'd been arrested after shooting a state trooper in a wild highway chase and driving through a roadblock of police cars in Leesburg. Two weeks before the Sentinel ran this story, Mary Catherine had given birth to Spencer's son, who was placed in foster care. In another development in Jacksonville, newspapers reported investigators said Spencer bore a close resemblance to an artist's sketch of a stranger seen near the home of a woman who disappeared in February. In her 2005 Folio Weekly cover story, Susan Clark Armstrong reports that Chief Investigator J.C. Patrick and Sheriff Dale Carson traveled to Miami to interrogate Spencer. While interviewing Spencer, J.C. Patrick beat the convicted murderer to the point of unconsciousness, breaking two of his ribs. Meanwhile, the UPI reported on December 17, 1961, a curly-haired young farmer from Mississippi confessed to strangling a pretty 19-year-old housewife from Florida. Roland Lee Lindsay had been farming near Oxford, Mississippi shortly before he was arrested for public, public drunkenness in Memphis, Tennessee. Not really sure why people like followed him across state lines for public drunkenness, it must have been something. And told police, I want to get something off my chest. Lindsay said he visited the Cochran's home, though he didn't know their names, as a traveling salesman, to demonstrate a portable sewing machine. He said he'd been drinking and got angry with Miss Cochran while making his sales pitch. He told Memphis police, quote, I strangled her with my own hands. Two days later, the Associated Press reported, authorities are convinced Ronald, not Roland, Lee Lindsay, 23, did not kill a young Jacksonville housewife. Apparently, Lindsay had made up his confession to get out of the drunk tank. Which brings us back to Spencer and Hampton. Journalist Gene Miller reported that Mary Catherine Hampton was known as a beauty. He calls her a, quote, dark-haired, attractive girl from the back hills of Kentucky. Detectives call her, quote, the Liz Taylor of the prison set. <laughs> she had a facial tick. True Crime magazines call Mary Catherine Hampton, quote, the hillbilly Lolita. She left rural Kentucky with a 28-year-old man named Sonny when she was 16 in 1959. 
It was a Florida sheriff's deputy who first told her Sonny was really Emmett Spencer, an ex-con who served a decade in Kentucky for shooting a doctor in the head on his front porch. Driving south from Jacksonville Beach, Hampton said she heard Spencer tell Shorty, Leon Hamill, that he wanted to kill the woman, and she'd assumed that meant her. Near Vero Beach, she watched Spencer walk off with Tomlinson and never saw her again. Further south, near Key West, Shorty disappeared with Spencer between the dunes amidst the roaring of the ocean. When Spencer sped back north, a state trooper pulled him over and ordered him out of the car. Mary Catherine Hampton leapt from the stolen Chevy, crawled into the patrol car. Spencer shot the trooper and sped off. And the cop followed Spencer 110 miles per hour for 30 miles. Spencer finally plowed through a roadblock of police cars, the Chevy riddled with bullets, and emerged uninjured. The fall of 1962, two Miami police detectives joined Jacksonville's James Wins Wingate and Donald Coleman to bring Emmett Spencer to town from Rayford State Prison for questioning in Beverly Cochran's disappearance. Coleman said Spencer took him to Silver's Bar, the supposed burial site near Atlantic Beach. The area, Armstrong writes, was overgrown. The deep foundation had been dug, the small concrete slab had been poured. It appeared the site was abandoned soon after. Spencer also directed them to the Ann Platt Apartments, described as, quote, just a couple of little clabber-covered beach cottages on 2nd Street. Spencer said he had kidnapped Beverly, brought her here to meet his buddy. Spencer said he didn't kill Beverly, but he was there when his friend did. Your buddy? Asked Coleman. You talking about McCormick? Yeah, replied Spencer. Which one? Clarence. What are you trying to tell me? That Clarence McCormick killed Beverly? Was that what you're saying, Coleman said? Yes, Spencer said. Clarence McCormick was the son-in-law of Beverly's parents, neighbor, sorry, Beverly's parents' neighbors. He had stalked her when she still lived in her childhood home and Beverly had told a friend, tried to break into the apartment she and Jim rented on Market Street when her husband was away at work. He was the son of B.B. McCormick, the Jack's Beach construction magnate, who was close friends with J.C. Patrick. Clarence was frequently in trouble with the law, as Susan Armstrong writes, on several occasions, Clarence McCormick was arrested in Jacksonville. B.B. McCormick made sure his son was always immediately released. Years later, in 1980, when Clarence McCormick was found murdered in a downtown Columbus, Georgia motel room, newspapers reported, quote, his massive Six foot plus, 300 pound frame, stripped nude, and two 38 caliber bullets lodged in his back. Clarence called himself Shotgun because he always carried a sawed off shotgun and a briefcase. Dale Carson and J.C. Patrick lost evidence. Soon, Patrick would be placed on sick leave after tampering with evidence in the Johnny May Chappelle investigation. And in 1969, J.C. Patrick Jr. confronted his father, beating his mother, raised a hunting rifle, and killed the city's chief homicide investigator. So this is Clarence McCormick, and apparently there was a, a gallery exhibit somewhere in Texas, I think it was in Fort Worth, of um, 
ex-con art, and that was his art. <laughs> This is B.B. McCormick, this is Dale Carson, uh, and this is J.C. Patrick Jr., who, uh, of course, was um, haunted for the rest of his life by, um, you know, what he knew about his father and um, what he had done. Carolyn Meeks was the child left in her crib the day Beverly Cochran was abducted in 1960. Her father, James, remarried, and Carolyn thinks of Jerry as her mother. She says she had a happy childhood, but her parents and grandparents were always too sad for her to ask about Beverly's disappearance. Throughout her childhood, she says, there were too many stories about what might have happened. Mistaken identity on a drug deal gone bad. Somebody got revenge at the wrong house. That's one story. The other story had to do with Clarence. My mother was young and attractive. The whole area was under construction. And the son of this wealthy businessman, McCormick was his name. The story we heard is that he kidnapped her and then beat her to death. Clarence McCormick is never charged. Beverly Jane Cochran is still listed as missing. Vera Gould was returning to Wales, the country of her birth. Her husband had died the year before. She was lonely. She planted a for sale sign in her front yard at 17th Avenue North, Jacksonville Beach. Later, Vera Gould's granddaughter, Kay Hester, stepdaughter of former Mayor Hans Tanzler's chief aide, Lex Hester, and niece of Jacksonville Sheriff's Office Public Information Officer Mike Gould, said she, her fiance and his sister had stabbed the 74 year old woman to death, quote, to drive out Satan. After Kay Hester, Billy Lee Magnuson, and Billy Lee's sister Renee choked and stabbed the elderly woman, then set five small fires around the kitchen, police found them walking the neighborhood barefoot, quote, chanting strange phrases. They were arrested at 18th Avenue North by Fletcher Jr. High just after six in the evening. Billy was 20 years old, the girls both 19. Newspapers soon quoted Billy and Kay, calling Vera Gold Satan, themselves the new trinity, and Lex Hester, the Antichrist. Newspaper headlines called the murder a ritual killing, a ritualistic knife death, a satanic slaying, and the Satan killing. At their bail hearing, when County Judge Lewis C. Corbin asked Kay Hester if she wanted the court to provide her an attorney, she said, I feel my silence will serve as my attorney, therefore my lips will keep sealed. She stood before the judge wearing a sleeveless sundress and no shoes, her hair and eyes wild. In her Florida Times Union story, Jesse Lynn Kerr described Billy Lee Magnuson as, quote, a tall, slender man with short, dark hair and thin mustache. Kerr said he was, quote, smiling while trembling and at one point appeared to laugh. Newspapers at first reported the three were on, quote, on drugs. Those psychiatrists later said testing showed no evidence of any drugs or alcohol. When Judge Corbin asked him why he declined an attorney, Billy Lee said, I am the judge and I am God and you know my name, don't you? Corbin asked, is there any other reason? And Billy Lee replied, is there any better reason? 
Kerr wrote, Jacksonville Beach Fire Captain Frank Brunson refused to speculate on the origin of the fires, nor would he confirm or deny that several lighted candles were found, adding, satanic rituals often involve the use of candles. The Magnusons and Kay Hester showed obvious signs of psychosis, but the eagerness for reporters to call them, quote, a satanic cult, and the killing of the satanic ritual led newspapers to distort the case. The late 1970s and into the 80s, Satanism and devil worship were favorite urban legends. While people most easily swept into the quote, what sociologists now often call satanic panic, were religious fundamentalist newspapers and law enforcement also fail, fell for the tall tales. Fundamentalists saw the devil everywhere. Anton LaVey, on the town in the bottom corner down there, had founded the Church of Satan in 1966 and published the Satanic Bible in 1969. The peace symbol was a satanic symbol, they said, an upside-down cross with the arms broken downward. Fundamentalists and evangelical church groups played rock songs backward. Remember this? <laughs> Playing backward messages influenced teens to worship the devil and kill their parents. Played backwards, led us up on the stairway to heaven, said, Oh, here's to my sweet Satan. Uh, the Eagles Hotel California, backward informed listeners, Satan organized his own religion. The Eagles supposedly posed Anton LaVey on their album cover in the song line, We Haven't Had That Spirit Here Since 1969, referred to the year LaVey published the Satanic Bible, Hotel California, from which, quote, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave, the evangelical said as a euphemism for the Church of Satan. Billy's and Kay's bizarre statements Included mentions of Satan and the Antichrist, but the three young people seemed to believe they were doing God's work. They never claimed to worship the devil. In fact, Hester's police report lists her religion as, quote, charismatic Christian, having recently spent time at a religious commune in, not making this up, this place is called Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina. <laughs> It was Satan they were trying to kill, unfortunately, in the form of Kay Hester's grandmother. They also believed they had the Antichrist in their sights. Billy Lee told psychiatrist Ernest Miller the Antichrist was none other than Kay's stepfather, the former Jacksonville chief administrator and architect of Jacksonville Duval County Consolidation, Lex Hester. Two days after the murder, December 17th headlines announced Hester to visit girl after satanic slaying. Broward County Administrator Lewis Hester said he'd leave for Jacksonville after work today, wrote Steve Parker of the, the uh, Fort Lauderdale News, where, quote, he hopes to see his 19-year-old stepdaughter charged Wednesday in the satanic cult-linked slaying of her grandmother, Hester never formally adopted Kay, his first wife's daughter from her previous husband, but Kay lived with Hester and her mother from age three to her mid-teens and took his last name. He said, it's a terrible tragedy. He said Kay had abused drugs in the past, but added, she is still my daughter. By the end of January 1977, psychiatrist Ernest Miller reported that Kay Hester and the Madison siblings quote, have been intensely involved in a religious experience in Savannah that Kay believed she was, quote, endowed with special powers she called the seven gifts of Abraham and exerted a strong psychological influence over Billy and Renee. Close friend of the Hesters in the 1970s says Kay met Billy Lee and Renee in Savannah when Billy was stationed at the Army Airfield at nearby Fort Stewart. They went up into North Carolina together, she says, and had some kind of religious experience there. 
On July 14, 1977, the Associated Press reported Dr. Eduardo Sanchez that Billy may have had some kind of psych uh, psychotic break when he joined the Army. Sanchez said he went back to his family in New York and they noticed a tremendous religiosity in him, something out of character with his previous beliefs. Miller referred to the Magnusons as, quote, very disturbed persons. He said, both suffered great psychological and physical abuse at the hands of their natural parents. Newswire headlines said, Hester's stepdaughter committed to mental hospital and Florida Times Union headline announced three held in a ritual murder ruled schizoid hospitalized. Miller said they, quote, commonly shared a visual hallucination on at least one occasion. Billy called himself the last prophet, said the world would be destroyed in 1982, and promised to fight the Antichrist in the world's last moments. The newspapers reported Kay Hester, the quote, dominant personality. Each story showed Billy Lee, the central, most charismatic character. It was Billy who said he was God, who said he lived in heaven. It was Billy who said he was going to fight Lex Hester, the Antichrist, at the end of the world. It was Billy who said the army was training him to use nuclear weapons. So it makes sense. The psychiatrist Eduardo Sanchez who met with Kay Hester and Madison in early January 1977, recalls Billy Lee as the dominant personality in a trio of shared psychoses called a folie a trois. I remember talking to Madison, Sanchez says, pausing to express wonder that the case was more than 40 years ago. He was fully psychotic. He was chanting and telling me he was God. Sanchez recalls Billy's psychotic reasoning, that he kept claiming Vera Gould was still alive. Quote, he kept telling me that he was God and that the grandmother was not dead. He both admitted that he was the one who stabbed Gould to death, though depositions suggest otherwise, and maintained he didn't kill her. He said he closed his eyes when he killed her, he said he was God, and God sees everything. Since he closed his eyes when he killed her, he didn't see the killing. Since God sees everything, and he, God, did not see her die, Vera Gold was still alive. Sanchez believes the Trinity suffered a shared psychosis, but perhaps only Billy was schizophrenic. Quote, a person can have a psychotic episode without being schizophrenic. Billy Lee's son confirms his father's diagnosis, so he tells me he only heard about what he calls Jack's Beach 76 about 10 years ago. Sanchez would later testify in court about the mental state of Otis Tool, who suffered under the influence of his lover, the killer Henry Lee Lucas, in a shared psychosis of Fabio Adu. A shared psychosis, Sanchez says, occurs when a weaker personality becomes completely dependent on a psychotic, stronger personality. The weaker person will change his perception of reality to maintain the psychological connection with the stronger person, Sanchez says. You can see, even in a marriage, how to keep the peace. One partner will distort his or her reality to match that of the other. In a folie a deux or folie a trois, the psychotic process is transferred to someone else to maintain the relationship. Virgil had, quote, led such a full life with her husband and family that at times she talked of not being needed any longer, said an anonymous teenage friend of both Kay Hester and her grandmother. The friend, as Bob Price of Florida Times Union called her in his December 1976 story, would visit his gold even when Kay wasn't in town. 
Vera and John Gould had married during World War I. After the war, John worked as a chef at Hotel Statler and other hotels in New York. And the Goulds operated a nightclub during Prohibition in the 1920s. They were robbed once by Al Capone's gang. <laughs> Kay Hester was indicted. Charges dropped for reasons of insanity. Spent time in the state mental institution. Two years later, she married and had a son and a daughter. She worked sporadically as a hairstylist. A close friend of the Hesters in the 1970s says Lex was devastated, shocked, and heartbroken for Kay. Lex Hester suffered a heart attack and died in the year 2000. He was 64. Renee Magnuson served on Chittenonga High School Student Council in 1975. In her yearbook, she wrote, Ambition, receive my registered nurse training, get married, and have a happy life. 1975 was the school's centennial. Kids posed in a giant 100 on the school lawn. The Palladium staff captioned the photo, we may never pass this way again. In 1997, Billy Magnuson married Reverend Carroll, whom he first met at a religious commune called Dayspring Farms in Kilbell Hills, North Carolina in the late 1970s. It's likely Billy brought Renee and Kay Hester to this encampment in the Outer Banks. The day spring is the place the Hester family friend referred to in saying they went up into North Carolina together and had some kind of religious experience there. That Kill Devil Hills is the place the New Trinity had their religious experience before trying to kill the devil in the form of Kay's grandmother. In 2004, the self-proclaimed Apostle Billy Lee and Carol Magnuson founded a church called the House of David Ministries in Virginia Beach. The two died just days apart in November 2018. In a blog called Day Spring Remembers Bill and Carol Magnuson, Mike Parsons writes, We at Day Spring Farms were honored to fulfill Sister Carol and Brother Bill's last request that they be laid to rest here on the farm. Funeral services consisted of a eulogy and the blowing of the shofar. Sister Carol, Mike Parsons writes, first came to Kill Devil Hills in the late 1970s when, quote, revival was still going strong. We would have meetings at many different houses as well as churches. Carol often hosted meetings while she lived here on the Outer Banks. Parsons writes about Carol and Bill, quote, laughing in the spirit during prayer once they realized God had assigned angels to them. About how Carol preached when healings began, other, quote, gifts of the spirit began to manifest. All right, so, who knows who this is? Oz Tool. Another photo of Oz Tool. This is um, a police lineup of charming looking individuals arrested in Springfield. This is Oz Tool looking off the side, as he so often did. Does anybody know who this is? Good guess, but no. <laughs> anybody else? So, there's a reason this says, uh, will the real serial killer step forward? Uh, 2013, my book, Stalking on His Tool of Southern Gothic, came out. And um, one of the things that fascinated me about Otis Tool was that there were so many different versions of him, depending on who you talked to. He was either someone who was very childlike, had an IQ of 75, was abused all his life, everybody pushed him around, um, or he was one of the worst serial killers in human history and he killed like 700 people, right? Big difference <laughs> in between. Um, so I was fascinated by that, and I wrote this book trying to bounce all these different odd tools off of each other. 
Um, and I still stand by the book. I still feel proud of the book. But a lot of people read it and still um, seem to think, yes, Otis Tool is the worst serious, uh, serial killer ever. Um, Ken McCullough, colleague of mine at FSCJ, incredible person, um, director who runs uh, FSCJ Drama Works, asked me to adapt Stalking Otis Tool for the stage um, in 2017. And he had, I think, this brilliant idea of splitting Otis into three characters. So instead of like all these hundreds of characters I was trying to bounce off of each other, uh, Ken came up with the idea of there being three different student actors who portrayed one, Otis the killer, two, Otis the mama's boy, and three, Otis the subservient lover. So, um, so I have a story in this book that I'm not going to tell you a whole lot about, but I try to set the record straight about Otis Tool. Um, <laughs> and um, I'll just leave it at that, and hopefully that will intrigue some people. But this other person, uh, his name is Patrick Allen Harrell. And um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, he lived in the Pickettville area of rural West Jacksonville, and he murdered prostitutes there, and he uh, staged them for after he had murdered them for other people to find. Uh, I spoke with his daughter, and so my story about him has, uh, is hugely infused by speaking with his daughter, if you can imagine the daughter of such a person, who told me that after visiting him in prison, um, how furious she felt with her mother when her mother, after not speaking with him for decades, um, started sending him love letters. So, um, Otis Tool is the fake serial killer. <laughs> um, Patrick Allen Harrell is the real one. I'll leave that there. Um, Alright, it's the last story that I will briefly get into, and then I'll just try and um, leave you with some thoughts and some questions. And this um, brings us close to our time period. So early in the morning or late at night, whichever way you want to quantify it, Saturday, July 18th, 1987, Mark Ace see there both smiling and crying. His brother Robbie and a friend named Bubba McQuinn, having spent the night shooting pool and drinking, decided to drive around and look for prostitutes. They took two separate pickup trucks, Mark with Bubba, Robbie by himself. In later statements, Mark said, he soon saw his brother Robbie's truck parked, window down, Robbie talking to a black person. He did not use the phrase, a black person. In the words of a later court brief, Ace, quote, immediately became confrontational with the man, Robert Lee Booker, despite the fact that his brother told him everything was all right. Ace verbally attacked Booker, spouting racial slurs and escalating the situation. Ace pulled a gun from his back pocket and shot Booker once in the stomach. Booker fled the scene, but was later found dead in an alley with a hole in his intestine and a severed murder. The night wasn't over. Mark Ace climbed back into Bubba McQuinn's pickup truck. His brother Roddy sped away in his own. When Bubba asked Mark why he shot Booker, Ace said, you've got to show him an order. Who's boss? Mark and Bubba kept prowling. Ace said he knew certain prostitutes in the area by name. Bubba slowed his truck alongside of Mark said he knew a named, uh, named Renee. Maybe they knew Renee, but didn't know. Robert. 
Maybe they knew Renee was a black woman, but didn't know she was a, quote, white male Hispanic. <laughs> Bubba demanded she get in his truck. Mark grabbed Renee's arm, and when she resisted, he shot her. Shot Renee, whose real name was Robert McDowell, in the chest six times. Johnny Sharp, so this is, this is Johnny Sharp, this is Mark Ace. this is the judge who we met. Johnny Sharp's testimony that he and Mark Ace had, quote, a loving sexual relationship in prison could have proven the killer, so his appeals claimed, was not racist because Johnny Sharp was black. Sharp testified in post-conviction proceedings dealing with sentencing and appeals, but not in the actual trial. In his April 1997 order denying a motion for post-conviction relief, responding to ASA's claims of ineffective counsel, Circuit Court Judge Lawrence P. Haddock referred to Sharp's testimony as Quote, one of the most bizarre and amusing, albeit useless, moments of courtroom experience that the undersigned has ever observed. <laughs> I start referring to myself as the undersigned. <laughs> Two decades later, August 21st headline from First Coast News Story said, sister of a man set to be executed Thursday, quote, he's not a racist. ASA wore tattoos of swastikas of the words white power and the abbreviation for supreme white power, SWP. ASA was 22 years old when he murdered 34-year-old Robert Lee Booger and 26-year-old Robert McDowell. ASA fear, uh, fiercely rejected, however, via appeal to the Florida Supreme Court the district court judge's opinion that Johnny Sharp's conviction and trial testimony might have allowed the state's attorney to argue that Mark Ace's shame or guilt regarding sexual relations with a black man in prison, quote, may have motivated him to hate blacks as a symbol and reminder whether Ace knew the black prostitute he murdered was transgender is a question nobody raised. Judge Lawrence Haddock could not understand why Ray David, Assay's attorney, would have called Johnny Sharp as a witness during the trial. Haddock called evidence of a, quote, promiscuous and perverted sexual relationship in 1986, over one year prior to these murders with a black fellow inmate at Tomoka Correctional Institute inadmissible, saying evidence of racial motivation does not make individual acts of alleged non-bias admissible. In August 2017, Ace became the first white man in the state of Florida ever executed for the murder of a black victim. So, Uh, this brings us to questions of why and some thoughts. Uh, probably most of you remember this campaign ad. Sorry. The campaign ad was shocking. It was meant to be. It began with the sound of rapid gunfire, an assault rifle. Most mass shootings in America take about two minutes. The sounds of gunfire overlapped with the sounds of a child crying. Uh, and there were uh, several words from different news sources, including Jacksonville among least safe major cities in the U.S. So, for as long as I can remember, news stories from around the nation have referred to Jacksonville as Florida's murder capital. 
killing spree in uh, Truman Capote, always looking tragic and turbulent. Um, Truman Capote's 1965 non fiction novel, uh, In Cold Blood, began at the edge of town here. For at least the last century, Jacksonville stood out nationally for its murder rates. 1927 Literary Digest article had Jacksonville leading the nation in murders with, quote, a staggering killing record of 75.9 per 100,000. That's higher. It's a higher rate today than lots of so-called third world countries at war. 1933 Literary Digest article titled, The High Murder Rate in the South, again pointed to Jacksonville at the top and included among, quote, contributing factors, the, the uh, sorry, the vestigial remains of an old chivalry which demands blood for violation of honor and, quote, a leniency toward pistol toters. This thinking was mainstream at the time. In 1934, Carl Frederick, president of the National Rifle Association, told Congress, quote, I do not believe in the general promiscuous coating of guns. I think it should be sharply restricted and only under license. It's shocking. <laughs> NRA. Then there's the matter of that, quote, old chivalry in the 1990s. Sociologists return to the effects of honor codes and the quid pro quo of blood for blood in the South. Richard Nisbet's Bob Cohen's social experiments found men from different social backgrounds in particular parts of the country much more sensitive to the slightest questionings of honor than others. A rigid code of honor demands that when someone insults you, your own respect and identity is predicated on responding at least in kind, if not with greater violence. FBI crime statistics regularly show that though the South represents roughly 25% of the United States population, it commits about 40% of U.S. violent crime. Jacksonville's murder rates have always correlated to the city's high rates of poverty, racial tension, deep educational deficits. Even as late as the 1990s, the last time such numbers were made public, I think and hope it's changed some since then, Duval County had an almost 50% functional illiteracy rate. My father, who died 2019, 95 years old, remembered stories of racial murder in the woods in Macon County, Georgia. His uncle, Phil Gilmore, uh, was one of his childhood heroes. Phil Gilmore had been a policeman in Oglethorpe, where his father was born, and Americus, Georgia. If he saw black boys walking on the sidewalk instead of the street, he'd hit them with the legs with his nightstick. Phil Gilmore, my dad, told me the story regularly when I was a kid. He killed a black man. For unknown reasons now, he pulled his gun. The black man grabbed it. The two men wrestled. And Phil fired the gun through his own hand killed the unnamed other man. Um, that was a story of uh, heroism, you know, for my dad um, when he was a kid and telling me as I was, as I was growing up. It's the last slide here. What about international context? I'm often surprised how many Americans don't know how much lower homicide homicide rates are in other wealthy nations. The New York Times put this, contra uh, this contrast in context. In France, you are as likely to die from a gunshot as you are from hypothermia in the United States. In Japan, 
You're as likely to die from a gunshot as you are from having been struck by lightning in the United States. Most American gun deaths aren't mass shootings. Most American gun deaths aren't even homicides. They're suicides. The United States holds 4% of the world's population, but 40% of the world's guns. Any correlation? In June 1990, when James Edward Pugh murdered 10 people and injured four others, Jackson offices for the General Motors Acceptance Corporation in Big Meadows, the American mass shooting was only a few years older than the mass production of assault rifles when Colt lost its patent for the AR-15 in 1977. Far side is an image from um, uh, Ken McCullough at FSJ, his production of um, I Play Every Possessions a couple of years ago. GMAC had no security, no bulletproof glass. The company had documentation of hundreds of threats going back more than a decade. And the company issued its succinct line of legal defense, quote, GMAC could not predict the kind of mass murder attack that had never before occurred within GMAC and had not been known to occur within GMAC's type of business, upon which courts summarily dismissed the suits of victims' families against the company. Both sides knew the statement was an absolute lie, but still believable in 1990. Back to an international context. In Jacksonville, in 2020, 554 people were victims of gun violence. 152 of Jacksonville's 176 homicides were shootings. In the whole country of Norway in 2020, there were 31 homicides. Norway's population is five times that of Jacksonville's. In 2018, there were 651 homicides in Canada. Again, I'm comparing the numbers of a whole country against the numbers of a single American city, right? Canada's population is 38 times that of Jacksonville's. In 2018, there were 60 homicides in New Zealand. New Zealand's population is about five times that of Jacksonville's. Across the United States in 2020, there were more than 19,000 gun homicides and 24,090 gun suicides. So, you know, there's no one reason why a person takes a life. Um, and the stories in this book are not scientific investigations. Um, but I think we're interested in murder stories for a couple of reasons, maybe, maybe several reasons, but you know, we're astounded by the cruelty and the callousness. Uh, also, you know, maybe we wonder um, what we could have done differently if we were in that situation, or what maybe someone that, you know, a loved one could have done differently in that situation. But I think if we talk about violent crime in the United States or in our own town, and we don't look at why things are as they are, and why things are better in lots of other places, we're irresponsible. Because what we've been doing about the problem here, year after year after year after year, it has not 